in your Bible with me to Romans chapter 4. Now, we want to continue today in our Bible study concerning the question asked in Acts chapter 16 to the Apostle Paul. The Philippian jailer had thrown them in jail. They prayed, and uh, God Almighty answered their prayer. An earthquake came, and the jail was broken down, and the jailer thought everybody had escaped, so he ran outside, tried to kill himself. He was going to probably commit Harry Carey and kill himself. But Paul said, do thyself no harm, we're still here. And so this jailer called for a light and he ran into where they were, fell down on his knees in front of them and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And remember that we've discussed that they did not answer him directly. They didn't tell him what to do to be saved and the reason they didn't was because there isn't anything that an individual can do today to be saved. So they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Why? Because Jesus Christ did what needs to be done in order for you to be saved. It is up to you to believe in him. It is up to you to put your confidence in him and trust him as your Lord and Savior to be saved. Now, in Romans chapter 4, notice in verse 4. Romans chapter 4, verse 4, the Bible says, Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace but of debt. In other words, if, if you could gain your salvation by working for it, it would be as if God owed it unto you, and it couldn't be of grace. Verse 5, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. In other words, if you will believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, even though you've never done anything good for Almighty God, just believing in him will please God, and God will put your faith in his Son to your account for righteousness. If I drew on the board up here and I say that your life is, is somewhat like unto a ledger, we open the ledger and on one side of the ledger there is what Jesus Christ did for us. There is Almighty God over there offering His Son, Jesus Christ, at Calvary. God Almighty foreknew your debts. The Bible said the wages of sin is death. So over here I put uh, adultery. I put adultery up there. I put murder up there. Uh, there's fornication. There's all your sins are there. And all your sins bring death. The payoff for your sins are death. And so God Almighty offered his son at Calvary. He sacrificed his son. The Bible said that God delivered him up for us all. The Bible says in John 3.16 that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The Bible tells me in Titus chapter 3 not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing the Holy Ghost, on and on and on. And he tells me there that he gave himself for our sins. Now the whole thing is then that God Almighty fixed a way so that you that are a sinner, he fixed a way so that you that are bad, your heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, the Bible says. The Bible said all have sinned and come short of the glory of God and that there is none good, no, not one. In other words, God identifies every individual alive on the face of the earth today as being like unto their father, Adam. By one man, he said, sin entered in the world and death by sin and death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. The Bible said, There is none good, no, not one. There is not a just person on earth that doeth good and sinneth not, and there is none that seeketh after God. 
Well, in spite of all that, people today say there is some goodness in each, in, in each individual, and they say, I sought God at an old-fashioned altar, and they say, I'm just trusting my heart, and they say, I opened up my heart and let Jesus come in. The Bible said, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So God condemns every individual. The Bible tells me clearly pertaining to the law. Look in Romans chapter 3, verse 19. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. In other words, the law shuts our mouth. The law puts us in a state and in a condition that there is nothing we can say. There is nothing we can repeat. There is nothing that we can used to justify ourselves before Almighty God. Our mouths are shut. It's as if the law says, shut your mouth. You're just babbling, you're just running off at the mouth. The law says you're not good. Look in Romans chapter 3, what the Bible says. In verse 10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Why, he said that all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. In other words, the goodness that you do in your lost state, you that are listening to my voice, that have never totally and completely committed yourself to the Lord, trusting Him to save you, and trusting what He did at Calvary for your salvation. The works that you do to gain that salvation is in the eyes of God as filthy rags. Hold on there and turn to Philippians chapter 3 and notice what Paul said about it. In Philippians chapter 3, and notice he gives a list of his good stuff. Verse 4, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he might, uh, whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. And he begins to list the things. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is the law, blameless. That is, he appeared blameless before mankind. Paul offered the blood sacrifices that were required under the law, and in the eyes of mankind, he would have been blameless. He would have been a good man. You would have called this man a good man if you would have ever called anybody good. And verse 7, but what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things, those things he could brag about up there, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having my righteousness, on and on and on. In other words, Paul counted those things that he did, those works that he did as a lost individual, he counted them but dung that he might win Christ and be found in Christ, not having his own righteousness, which is of the law, but the righteousness which is of God by faith in Christ. If you trust Christ as your Lord and Savior, God puts that to your account as righteous, even though you're unrighteous in the world, even though you're unrighteous in the flesh. Go back in Romans 3 again. In Romans 3 verse 11, there is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. Men cannot understand the things of God, and so God never required that you understand People say, if I could just understand that, you don't need to understand. You will never have to give an account to God for the things you can't understand. You're going to have to give account to God for the things you refuse to believe. God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. The issue is not, do I understand all things of God? I do not understand the things of God. I believe them. I believe the Bible means exactly what it says, as it says it, where it says it. I may not understand that, and I may get all crossed up in trying to explain things sometimes, but I sure believe they mean what they say. That's the reason I try my best to stick with the Scripture and say what the Bible says. Well, what does the Bible say? In verse 
12, it says they're all gone out of the way. They're together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Then you don't do good, do you? Why, with that thought in mind, look across the page at chapter 4, verse 4 again. Now to him that worketh is the Lord, not reckoned of grace but of debt, but to him that worketh not but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. In view of the fact that all your works are as filthy rags in the eyes of Almighty God, why would you want to perform works to gain salvation? Why would you not want to just trust Christ and believe in what he did for you at Calvary? That's where the righteousness comes. In Romans chapter 3, notice in verse... 13, their throat is an open sepulcher. A sepulcher is a grave. When you open your mouth as a lost individual, it's as if a grave has opened up. Why the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 that you were dead in trespasses and sins. He says in Ephesians chapter 2 that you were without hope and without God in the world and without strength to do anything about it. You that are listening to me that have never totally and completely trusted Christ, you've never completely turned your salvation over to the Lord Jesus Christ and depended on Him to save you, you're lost, you're dead in trespasses and sin, you're without the power to save yourself, you're without any strength to perform the goodness of Almighty God, and all your works are as dung in the eyes of Almighty God. Why will you keep doing them? Why will you keep struggling and straining? Why will you keep trying to satisfy God when it is obvious you can't satisfy God in your flesh? Why, he said, the natural man, that's you, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. He said the carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. You that have never been saved, you that have never turned your case over to the Lord and trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior, redeemed by His blood, your carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to God. It can't be subject to God. Then why keep on trying? I quit trying to be a Christian years ago. I'm not trying to be a Christian. I'm not trying to be saved. I'm not trying to gain heaven. I have totally and completely trusted in a man, believing in that man Jesus Christ to have died for my sins. I've turned my case over to him, and the Bible said we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he's the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but the sins of the whole world. Why will you keep struggling? Why don't you just trust Christ? That's all God requires of you. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Back in Romans chapter 3, verse 13, their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they've used deceit. That is, you've told lies. The poison of asp is under their lips. Why the false teachers today are like snakes, and that's what Jesus Christ calls them in Matthew chapter 23. He said, you snakes, you serpents, you vipers, how shall you escape the damnation of hell? And so false prophets today in the religious system are like serpents that strike you and the poison of their teaching gets in you. It gets in your mind and it warps you and twists you and gets so you so that it is very difficult to believe the truth anymore. As a boy back in Alabama years ago, I was raised on a farm. I don't know a whole lot, but there are a few things I know. I know that when you get ready to raise a crop, there are some things that need to be done. Just like the Bible says, he said to Israel, break up your fallow ground. And so you go there 
and you cut away the stalks from the last crop. You cut away the weeds that came up after you laid the crop by the year before. After you lay by, there will be weeds that will come up there. You quit plant the, the, the corn plants and the cotton plants and whatever are too big to keep on plowing. So one day you just stop. You don't plow anymore. And weeds and stuff will come up in there sometime. Now before you plant a new crop, you go and then you cut all that and you mulch it up. And then you come in there with a turning plow and turn it all under and you start afresh. You plant in new ground, so to speak. I'm saying unto you, religious leader, start afresh. I'm saying unto you, religious person that has never completely trusted Christ, start anew. Turn under the old crop. Do away with it. Plow it under. And trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. There are several kinds of ground that is referred to in Matthew chapter 13. Some of the seed sowed fell by the wayside and the birds of the air came and got it. And so, in sowing the word of God, in sowing the seed, and the Bible tells me in Luke chapter 8 that the seed is the word of God, so in sowing the word of God, I know that some of it just falls by the wayside. People hear it, it goes in one ear and out the other. They forget what I've said by the time the program's over. He said, some fell on stony ground. There's some of you that have hearts of stone. You're so set in your denominational system and your religious system that the word of God cannot penetrate your heart. It's like throwing seed on cement and the seed just lays there and scorches and dies away. Your hearts are like cement. Your hearts are like rock. Jesus Christ, through the Apostle Paul, described it pertaining to your conscience as being seared with a hot iron. That is, you've listened to false teaching and that false teaching has bothered your conscience and bothered your conscience and seared it until you're toughened to it. And your heart is like a rock. And so the seed never takes root. And then he said, there was some of the seed fell among thorns. The thorns represent the false teaching today. It represents that crop that has been planted by false teachers in the denominational system who refuse to rightly divide the word of truth, and so it's like tares out there. They fell among the thorns, and the, they first they sprouted all right, and they came up all right. But then the thorns choked them and they never brought forth any fruit. You know what the religious system's doing today? Listen to me. The religious system out there is working and toiling and slaving and striving and running to and fro and buying buses and sending out the buses and bringing in the loads and paving the parking lots and putting steeples upon their buildings and little crosses upon the steeples and little hearts upon the crosses and on and on and on. But no fruit unto God. They're not getting people saved by grace through faith. They're not preaching the gospel of Christ to people. They're preaching a salvation of works to people. And nothing ever comes of it except trash. Finally, the trash will be cut down and cast into the fire and burned. He said, come out from among them and be ye separate and touch not the unclean thing. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. 
get out of there. Back in Romans chapter 3 again. Verse 14, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood, destruction and misery in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. I bet you I'm talking to somebody right now. You've never had peace in your heart. You don't remember ever a time that you had peace. No way have you ever had peace. You've tried. You've prayed at the altar. And for a moment there you felt pretty good. But once it was all, the emotion of it was all gone. You didn't have any peace. You've laid down your sins. You've stopped your tobacco and your alcohol and the other things. And for a while you felt good over what you did. But then you get right back to where you were. You don't really have any lasting peace. There is no peace in their hearts. You never had peace in your life. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The reason you never had any peace is because you never went to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. You went to God through prayer at the altar. You went to God through the confessing of your sins. You went to God through your water baptism. You went to God through your church membership and it's the wrong God. The only way to get to the God that can save your soul is to get to him by his son, Jesus Christ. He said, no man cometh to the Father but by me. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. You want to get to God? Then believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe what? That he died for your sins at Calvary, that he paid for them at Calvary, and quit working. You know how I know that you haven't trusted him as your Savior because you haven't quit trying to work to get your salvation. I'm talking to people right now that you believe there's more to it than that. You say, oh yes, I believe in trusting the Lord, but I believe you've got to work to keep your salvation. Well then, you don't believe in trusting the Lord, do you? If you trust the Lord, you trust the work of the Lord. Why, Jesus Christ hang at Calvary for you there, and he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. He finished the work that you could be saved. In Romans chapter 3, verse 18, there is no fear of God before their eyes. If you ever get scared, you can get saved. Jesus said he came to seek and to save the lost. If you can ever get lost and recognize that you're a lost sinner hanging over hell by a heartbeat, there might be hope for you. There's no fear of God before their eyes. Why, you know the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. People in this world don't fear the Lord. The educational system today, they don't fear the Lord. If they did, they'd quit teaching people against the Lord. Any school that teaches evolution don't fear God. People don't fear God. They don't believe that they might fall off into hell this very day. You listening to my voice, you don't believe you're going to hell. If you thought you might fall into hell before this service is over, you'd fall on your face before God and trust His Son as your Savior. You don't believe you're going to hell. There's no fear of God before their eyes. You've been taught a religious system that stopped you from fearing the God of eternal glory. Why, the Bible tells me about a time. He said, I saw a gray white throne. And him that sat on it from whose faith heaven and earth fled away, and there was found no place for them. And he said, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And he said, the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And he said, the dead were judged out of the things written in those books, according to their works. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. The sea gave up the dead which were in it. Death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. He said, this is the second death. If you honestly from your heart meditated on it and believed that you might fall into hell today, you'd do something about it. You know how I know that? Because if you believed your house was burning down on you right now, if I saw your house was a fire, it was going to fall in on you, and I said, get out of there! Your house is burning down! You're going to burn! You'd do everything in your power. You'd struggle and strive. You'd do everything to get out of that house to save yourself from burning. 
You don't believe in hell. If you really believe you're going to hell, you'd trust Christ. You know what makes me know that the people in the Mobile, Pensacola area, they don't really believe what they say they believe. You know, I know, I have people say, well, I'm not afraid. And I feel like saying liars. You know why? Two or three years ago, some of you remember, there was a hurricane came into this area here. And everybody thought that hurricane was coming in here. The news service, they all said it's coming in. And you know what people did? They jumped into their motorhomes and their buses and their cars and whatever they could get, and they ran north while they clogged Highway 29 going out of Pensacola, uh, bumper to bumper going up that way, and on and on. They went up and they raided motels in Birmingham and all the way up there. You know what? Scared. They are afraid to die. So finally they got all clear, back they came. They went back to their homes, took their boards down and everything, and lo and behold, that thing turned around. And so I believe God Almighty was showing some people something. That thing came back. And you know what everybody did? They nailed up their windows again. They jumped back in their vehicles and they took off heading north, scared to death. But they're not afraid of hell. If you knew you're going to die today, if you absolutely knew that this was your last day upon earth, what would you do right now? Would you trust my Savior? Well, it very well may be your last day. The Bible said this is the day of salvation. Now is the day of salvation. Right now is the time to trust Christ as your Savior. Don't wait for tomorrow. You may not have a tomorrow right where you are right now. Will you trust Him? Just right there before Almighty God, would you, as it were, bow your head and say amen to what Christ did at Calvary? Would you just turn it over to Him right now? Just commit your salvation to Him right now, believing that He died for your sins, was buried and rose again? Will you trust Him as your Savior right now? Will you claim it? Why, the Bible said, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you believe that He paid for your sins at Calvary, was buried and rose again, and you'll have Him to save you right now, then ask Him to save you. Believe it in Him and confess Him with your mouth. Will you do that right now, right where you are? It may be your last opportunity. I thank you for listening today. Until next time, good day.